uh, but anyway so let us begin uh, okay if everyone is ready we can begin um, so welcome to the third session of the canada india education forum um, hosted by impact media and events corporation um, before we begin let me uh, give you a quick uh, introduction about the uh, about the work we do impact media and events corporation <coughs> Uh, we are a media and events company based in Brampton, Ontario since 2002. Uh, we organize Make in India themed uh, sector specific conferences between Canada and India, uh, provincial and interprovincial events between Canada and India, as well as uh, speaker series lectures and in person business leaders roundtables. We also have a YouTube channel and a Facebook page for IMAC where you can watch all of our events and conferences plus of course the twitter instagram and linkedin pages uh, we are also hosting a major india at 75 gala on may 29 india at 75 food festival on august 28 and india at 75 dance festival on october 16 soon we are also starting business delegations from one canadian province to another and uh, in the planning stage right now for three Canadian provinces uh, before the end of this year. Uh, cabinet ministers from Canada and India, senior ministers from various Canadian provinces, uh, MPs, MPPs, city and regional councillors, high commissioners, ambassadors, and consul generals from Canada, India, and USA, uh, presidents and CEOs of large companies, and prominent personalities from different sectors participate at IMAC events, both virtual and in person. So this is the third session in our Canada India Education Forum, where we bring together Canadian colleges and universities, as well as other uh, stakeholders in the bilateral education corridor. For more information or to join us as an annual partner, you can email uh, me or uh, just visit the website, uh, imac.bees. Um, so education is a very important sector in the bilateral corridor with uh, thousands of Indian students coming to Canada uh, to study every year, generating hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, for Canadian colleges and universities and in the Canadian economy overall. Many of these students also stay back after their studies, becoming permanent residents and Canadian citizens. Coming to a new country alone for the first time in your life at a fairly young age, can be a very challenging experience for most people. And the last two years uh, have been very tough, especially for international students. Because um, even after paying very high tuition fees, you know, which are normally three, four times uh, the fees that the domestic students pay, um, they have still been only able to take classes virtually. And uh, in most cases, did not get any break on their tuition fees uh, as well. Um, the sense of loneliness, uh, also, you know, as many students uh, live in basements, shared accommodations, uh, with uh, lack of proper facilities to study remotely, uh, when you have five, six, ten other students sharing their uh, accommodation uh, with not uh, much privacy um, or a quiet time available, lack of jobs and income due to lockdowns, etc., also resulted in severe mental uh, breakdowns, depression, and in some cases, student suicides as well. That is why it is very important to discuss the issues and challenges international students face and what kind of support system is available uh, at Canadian colleges and universities for them. We have several uh, representatives from, Canada, from colleges and universities, uh, educational institutions, as well as the Consul General of India to Toronto to share their knowledge and perspective on this very sensitive issue. Uh, before I begin and invite our keynote uh, speaker for today, uh, let me thank the IMAX sponsors, uh, without whom this session and all our other Canada-India uh, initiatives would not be possible. Um, so they are uh, Simply Financial, uh, Tendentia, Efficience Canada, uh, Home Hotel and Resort Limited, One Place, Pavi Binning, Natu Oil Services, Seneca College, Skyling Capital Corp, SBI Canada Bank, 
ICICI Bank Canada and Akal Insurance. So with that, uh, please welcome our keynote speaker for uh, today, the Dynamic uh, Consul General of India to Toronto, uh, Apurva Srivastava. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Namaskar. Uh, so, sorry, let, sorry uh, let us introduce you first. Uh, I forgot to say that. Um, so uh, Apurva Srivastava is a career diplomat uh, having joined the Indian Foreign Service in 2001. Uh, prior to being appointed as India's Consul General in Toronto, she worked with the Minister of External Affairs from January 2017 to August 2019. Uh, in her 19-year diplomatic career, she has served twice in the Indian Embassy in Paris from August 2003 to October 2006 and again from August 2012 to July 2015 and in the Indian Embassy in Kathmandu from June 2009 to August 2012. In the headquarters, she has served as Under Secretary in SARC and as Director Administration. Consul General Ms. Shivasta holds a Master's in Psychology from Lucknow University. She speaks Hindi, English, and French. Uh, she is married to Mr. Anshuman Gaur, a career diplomat. They have two daughters. So over to you now, Apurvaji. Uh, namaskar and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you, Vipalji, for uh, providing this platform for discussing uh, the concerns and the issues uh, faced by Indian students here in Canada. Uh, in in uh, the last few months, we have intensified uh, engagement with uh, various community leaders, uh, industry associations, uh, police, and other stakeholders for strengthening support for uh, systems for our students. Uh, our aim is to take preventive measures and address the issues and when they crop up and improve the overall academic experience of uh, Indian students in Canada. Uh, and I think this uh, sessions like this, uh, the one we are having today help in bringing the issues to the forefront and it becomes easier to understand uh, for uh, the concerns for all of us, which paves the way for finding appropriate solutions for it. Um, as you are aware, uh, India and Canada are natural partners, they are strategic partners and cooperation in higher education uh, is a very important element for this partnership. Uh, Canadian universities and colleges are well known in uh, India and a large number of Indian students are attracted to Canada for pursuing post-secondary studies. In fact, India has been the top source of foreign students of, for Canadian universities and college for many years now. Uh, we have nearly 230,000 Indian students uh, studying in Canada. Uh, India is the largest source, source of uh, being the largest source of international students. Uh, and re recently, we are, I had seen a report where uh, the largest number of students we sent from India to anywhere of the world, anywhere in the world, is to Canada. So it's the largest numbers from both sides. Um, of course, these students bring in larger revenues to the Canadian economy. And after their studies, most of these students will stay in Canada and contribute to the growth and development of the local economy. Uh, these students will uh, create bridges of friendship between our two countries. So it is very important that the students receive the best possible education and training so that they become uh, productive uh, global citizens. Um, uh, so, so during my two and a half years, whenever I've got, got uh, you know, whenever the restrictions were lift, lifted, I traveled to different provinces. Uh, within provinces, uh, I, I was in Sudbury yesterday, I was uh, in Windsor last, last week, and uh, I've, tra I've always made it a point to travel to various yeah. universities and colleges and uh, meet the students and uh, listen to their problems. Um, um, while I'm happy that most of the students are satisfied with the overall educational experience in Canada. However, at the same time, we have come across a few cases where Indian students were found, uh, um, you know, they, we had some uh, were undergoing some unpleasant incidents. Um, there have been cases of suicides, overdose of drugs, drowning, uh, drive, rash driving, fraud related to jobs, uh, et cetera. Uh, some, uh, you know, in last one month, we uh, we saw that there were five students who, who unfortunately passed away in an accident. Um, there was one, uh, uh, one student who was sh uh, shot uh, near the Metro in Toronto. Uh, there was one student who drowned in New Brunswick. So this is in last one month. So this is really heart wrenching and very, very unfortunate incidents that we, have to deal with and uh, uh, 
uh, apart from that, you know, as Vipul ji said that they, the students, when they come here, uh, many of them at after 12th, uh, they are very tender in age and uh, uh, they, uh, they need a lot of guidance. Uh, in India, most of them have not worked. I mean, not done household course here. They have to come. Uh, they have to study. They have to, uh, they also do part-time jobs. They have to look after the house. So it sometimes becomes very stressful and this, and without your family, uh, it's, it can be really stressful. So number of students are facing anxiety and mental health issues and really need uh, appropriate guidance and support from all of us. And this is this has to be a, a, a overall approach. You know, it's not one person can do it. Consulate, uh, the local government, community organizations, all of, of us have to come together to create an atmosphere where Indian students may feel comfortable and uh, at least they, they provide platforms where they can talk about it. Uh, given the num uh, increasing number of such cases, we have taken some proactive steps to rope in the wider community and other stakeholders uh, to create appropriate support systems for ensuring well-being of Indian students. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, there are also cases where they were students are misguided by agents, uh, uh, and uh, they were uh, they were told that something else, some they'll study something else, some the, that about the environment of the country. But uh, when they come here, it's a totally different thing. So we have to be, you know, we have to be uh, uh, take into cognizance all these things as well. Uh, we recently, uh, we already have a few brainstorming sessions and have come up with various suggestions uh, uh, to assist the students in making a successful transition to life in Canada. Uh, we are working on a coordinated and meaningful initiative that identifies and addresses the issues and equips the students to deal with social, culture, financial and other challenges. Uh, we are planning to have a core team of volunteers dedicated to supporting students. Uh, uh, these could be people from different walks of life with relevant experience in student exchange, uh, ex ex engagement and student service. Um, we can create com various communities to focus on employment and career counseling, uh, health and wellness issues, including mental health, mentorship and volunteering, and basic needs such as housing, food, transportation, etc. So uh, in my interaction with the community, I have seen there's a lot of people who really want to volunteer their time, their money for these kind of activities. And what we plan to do is what we aim to do is to bring kind of a semblance of bringing everything, everybody together. So there's whenever there's some similar problems, you know, people know that this is happening and they can help. Um, uh, um, I would like to uh, avail myself of this opportunity to urge, you know, all Indian students to you know, really focus on their studies and avoid situations where can, they can find themselves on the right, wrong side of law. Uh, accomplishing a good degree is as important as taking good care of yourself. Uh, um, it, and if, 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 if you find yourself in adverse situation, please reach out to us. We'll try our best to help you. Um, our consulate is your home away from home. Uh, we provide, of course, various kinds of consular services, uh, which, of course, you will be needing. Uh, you have, I'll request you to register with us and follow us on social media. And they are the most effective way to engage with the consulate. Um, at the end, I really want to say that this is a whole community approach. All of us have to come together and uh, uh, create an environment where these students can flourish and uh, do uh, bring out their best. Uh, I sincerely hope that today's session will stimulate more ideas that can be used to support the students. Uh, let us work together to strengthen uh, student support systems and ensure welfare of students while they pursue higher education in Canada. Thank you. Jai Hind. Hey, Paul, you're mute. Okay, so thank you for the uh, insightful remarks, Apurvaji, as always. Uh, and uh, in terms of, so I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, in terms of uh, student suicides and deaths, it seems to be a terrible trend upwards. Um, the consulate office is doing a tremendous job, as we all know, in repatriating bodies back to India uh, and providing other support. Um, and there are many people, including Mr. Kamal Bhargaj, who is with us on the panel today, who do, who do a commendable job in, in, uh, in this kind of uh, repatriations. Um, but in your interactions with the students, what do you hear from them, you know, uh, and is this a temporary challenge or is this a sign of a deeper problem? 
You know, I, as I said, you know, uh, when I interact with the students, um, most of them I found were quite happy with the, with the college, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, support pro provided by the college and the things. But of course, there, there is a deeper problem, you know, uh, the problem of adjusting to a new country, uh, a problem which has been exacerbated by COVID-19. So uh, all these problems when come together, then of course, uh, you know, in, various other parts of the you know gta is one there's a different problem set set of problems in gta but when you go to up north in ontario or other atlantic provinces there are different sets of problems so uh, what i have been trying to do as till now is i have been working very closely with the community organizations and uh, i must say that i must commend the community organizations to always always you know help out the students in whatever way possible uh, we do we do help you know sometimes of course we give financial help also but mostly it's the community organizations that uh, that that come together and you know sometimes for instance if i get a message from somewhere that uh, uh, in new brunswick there is a student who is who has covid and he needs help and i definitely we contact the community organization there and uh, they immediately respond to that um, uh, so you know there's a different set of problems and i'm sure uh, and what we had been planning with uh, there's a community there's a uh, a student group meeting which we did uh, around a month ago and uh, we realized that uh, various subcommittees have to be made and we are working on it i'm sure once this is operational uh, it will really streamline all the efforts together okay um so a couple of days back actually um i saw news um i don't know at what stage it is right now but i saw news that india is now in the process of or seriously considering uh, recognizing degrees offered by uh, foreign educational institutions uh, in India. Um, so when that takes uh, effect, how will it affect students going abroad? Will they still be going out as much or does it make any fundamental difference in the education I think what, what you read was, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the foreign uh, courses could be taught in India and those will be you know it, it can be a complementary kind of thing that, that's still happening in some cases but of course uh, you know um, if colleges would be able they, to open their branches in India but uh, they have to come here so uh, I mean people will go out for education I mean um, and uh, everybody will have to go out but let let the uh, laws be implemented first and then uh, then we can work out how, how how it will pan out yeah so i mean lastly very briefly uh, in light of the new education policy announced uh, last year um, what are some of the major uh, changes that you see uh, in the education scenario in india and how does it affect uh, cooperation internationally uh, one of the international impact of uh, national education policy is this now top 100 uh, universities can open their branches in India. So that that is one impact that, you know, if, for instance, you know, if University of Toronto opens some uh, 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 branch in India, of course, that will uh, going to impact more, co uh, it will have more impact on the cooperation between the two countries and in exchange of students and things. Um, other, other than that, you know, new, new economic policies has a lot of changes, more, more flexibility provided, which was not uh, provided earlier in our education system in choosing the subjects. There was uh, local language and many other, many other things have been thing. But uh, the international impact is basically, you know, the, uh, uh, the top 100 universities will be able to open their, uh, their branches in, in India if possible. And we'll, we request you to persuade uh, that uh, many universities to to consider doing that. Sure, absolutely. So thank you for that, uh, Apuraji. Please stay back with us as long as you can um, to hear Before from the uh, other speakers. Yes. Can I, yeah. can I take a quick screenshot here? Sure. Yes. OK, so if everyone uh, could all look into your cameras, uh, smile. I'll take a screenshot at the count of three. Counting up, one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so let us move to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Usha George. Uh, if you can uh, see her introduction. Uh, Dr. Usha George is a professor in the School of Social Work 
at Ryerson University and the current academic director of the Ryerson Center for Immigration and Settlement. She is the former interim vice president of research and innovation and dean of the faculty of community services. She came to Ryerson in 2006 from the faculty of social work, University of Toronto, where she had been professor and associate dean from 94 to 2006. Dr. George's main areas of uh, teaching, research and professional activity are social work with diverse communities, newcomer settlement and integration. Uh, Dr. Usha George immigrated to Canada in 1990 and worked as the executive director of the then South Asian Family Support Services in Scarborough and as the senior program director of Social Planning Council, Toronto. Um, she has won several recognitions for her contributions in the field of education, including 2015 Erol uh, Award for Outstanding Academic Leadership from Ryerson University. So over to you, uh, Ushaji. You're on mute. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm probably going to say uh, I, something that everybody seems to know, but in any case, I have a, a, a very short um, a PowerPoint presentation that kind of gives us a, 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 an idea of the entire uh, issues here. So let me see whether I can share my screen. Oh my God, I don't even know how to do this. Okay. Sorry. Can you see this? Uh, not yet. I have to share the screen. Oh. Okay, you can see it now. Oh, you can? Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You can see it now? Um, no. no. Oh, God, what did I do? Ah, stop sharing your screen. I, they, it says that you are screen sharing. Ah, there we go. Can you see it now? No, not as well. Okay. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, yes. yeah. okay. Um, so I titled my presentation as Indian International Students, but before I go into the details of the international Indian international students, I wanted to give you a profile of international education. Uh, here are some significant facts. Uh, one is that uh, Canada from being a, a, an emerging uh, leader in international education has now come up to be what is called a significant player in the international education scene. And that is demonstrated by the statistics here. In 1920, for example, there were only 1,300 full-time students. Uh, whereas from uh, in, uh, in 2020, it was 530,000, 540 students, which fell from 630, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, God. Um, so it fell from uh, 638, uh, 960 because of COVID. Um, otherwise, the numbers would have been 600 uh, something. Uh, the profile of international students are mostly they are male, 55% and 45% female. The age range is about 18 to 25. And 34% um, of the international students are from India. And uh, of course, the next largest is 22, 22% uh, from China. Some time ago, it was like Chinese students who dominated the international education scene, but right now it's Indian students. Um, so what, you know, four or five 
in fact, four out of 10 students are from India. Out of which, um, if you look at some of the other significant facts, 46% um, of these students are coming to Ontario and 22% are coming to British Columbia. And then the rest are distributed among other provinces in Canada. On the whole, um, they have spent about, international students have spent about $21.6 billion in Canada every year in tuition and other expenses. And they have generated over 445 million in government revenue and created over 81,000 jobs. Now, these figures vary. I, I, a little while ago, I left, an, uh, sorry, I read another report which says they filled in um, uh, 170,000 jobs. So the figures are not exactly right, but the fact is that uh, Canada has become a significant player in international education and derives a great deal of benefit from that. And therefore, what has happened is that the Canadian government is actually proactively promoting international education. Um, in the past, it was a very passive uh, sort of policy maker in, in international education. But right now, uh, the um, Immigration, Refugees and, and uh, Citizenship Canada has got international education um, offices. They also have um, an advisory panel on international education because they find that this is a, a huge source of not only of income, but also of, of immigrants. For example, in 2021, the target for uh, immigrants for Canada was 431,000, um, out of which only a small percentage actually came from outside. Majority of the, the, uh, the people who became uh, permanent resident holders were actually in Canada, out of which there's a significant number were from international students who finished their education, got jobs, and were able to apply for, um, uh, for PR. PR is a, a permanent residence permit. Now, here is a sort of a, the, the sad side of it. The international student fees are almost three times that are paid by domestic students, we all know that. And for example, fee for a two-year diploma is more than $32,000. Uh, and this is in an undergraduate, um, you know, uh, undergraduate education. It's not even undergraduate education, it's a diploma in something which is a two-year diploma program. Uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, a few years ago, I was a, um, I was a, a, a convocation speaker at one of the uh, colleges and they were broadcasting the convocation to many countries in the world because the, pay, the, the students who were graduating were from many, many different countries, the parents of whom wanted to see the ceremony. So you can see how international education has expanded and colleges have literally beaten uh, universities to that, in that game simply because of the two year diploma. Um, award and then what we can get. Again, the, the other issue that we need to look at is that what does that mean for international students? Especially when they come to Canada, they are all interested to come to Canada. Um, the latest is that Canada is number one in terms of preference for international education, especially for students from India. But every student ends up having a debt of about 70,000 to 100,000 dollars for repayment. Uh, whether it's usually the parents who support the international students and therefore, you know, it is that big amount of, um, of loan that they have to repay. Now, when you come to uh, international students from India, there's a, there are a number of um, issues that they face, which is not unique to Indian students, but, um, you know, they are, they are worth uh, pursuing for our understanding. Um, most of the Indian international students are attending public and private colleges for diplomas. Um, the level, the number of international students in the college, in the university system are relatively few when compared to those in the college system. Um, uh, for example, the University of Toronto has the highest number of international students uh, um, attending from all parts of the world. Indian students are on top, especially for technology, uh, computer science, um, and then um, physical and natural sciences. Uh, social science is very few, I would say. Uh, but 
um, other universities just catching up, but colleges have actually beat everybody in that game. There have been a number of studies on Indian international students, out of which one that I'd like to mention is the is a study by uh, Sutama Ghosh um, uh, uh, from Ryerson University. She's part of a, a bigger project. Uh, she actually interviewed a number of interna Indian international students and asked them about the, the issues they face. She, and she identified three main areas of concern. One is migration itself. That is basically most of the migration happens. Uh, the information for that uh, comes from uh, consultants who operate in India. And these consultants can vary, uh, or the information that consultants provide can vary from really straightforward, honest opinions to really sort of misleading information. Uh, and, and, and people fall somewhere in between, depending on which consultant they go to. In fact, they don't even know that they can apply straight away to these colleges and get the, get the admission. I don't know wh why they go through consultants, but consultants play a huge role there in providing the information, providing the processing and all of that kind of stuff. So migration, it, it, uh, and then the visa process, of course, Canadian um, embassies, uh, sorry, High Commission takes a, a lot of time processing this. So you have to kind of apply ahead of time and do all of that and then wait for um, uh, wait for the results. So it's nerve wracking. So there is, I can understand how they kind of go to the consultants for advice and, and, and help with the processing, but they're also paying the consultants a big amount of uh, money uh, in order to kind of get that done. The biggest area of concern is the settlement. Um, I want to kind of explain that a little more. Um, settlement is sort of the time when they come to the country, they enter the country and how do they settle down to their studies, to the, to the new society, to the new surroundings, to, to, the, to, the, to you know, everything that is around them. So the settlement issue itself is huge uh, uh, in the sense that one academic, that the one that I am very familiar with is the academic part. Um, at Ryerson University, uh, we have international students, but not a lot of them are from India, but they are increasing in numbers. And they are, many of them are, are for, for coming for postgraduate education. So they are a little more savvy than the average um, sort of 18 to 25 year olds who come. The academic issue is a huge challenge for many of them simply because the Indian education system and the Canadian education system are extremely different from each other. So um, the Canadian education system expects a lot of uh, independent work by the students, um, creativity, problem solving, uh, all of that, participation in class, uh, you know, readings, all of that is totally new to them, to the Canadian, to the, to the Indian international student. Um, having come from India as a gone to the US as a as an international student very, very long time ago, I can relate to that in a way. So the academic challenges are many. And one of the things that I heard of, I've heard from students is that they don't even know what, what they are allowed to do and not allowed to do. In other words, a concrete example is plagiarism. You know, in India, if you copy uh, five sentences from a book and put it as, a, as a, in, a, in your paper or in your essay, in your thesis, or in your dissertation, nobody's going to ask you anything because they don't even kind of have that concept. I don't know whether they have it now, but here, every sentence that you take out from someone has to be cited, has to be sourced. And a lot of international students have no clue. So student papers can be sort of scanned for the amount of, of plagiar plagiarized material that is present, um, present in the essay. And there are software programs that can do that. Turnitin is a favorite popular program. So, you know, kind of uh, apply that to the, to the essay and they can easily detect how much of plagiarism has happened. Many international students, especially the ones who come from India, have that huge issue around um, not knowing that plagiarism is a, a kind of a major, uh, what do I say, fault line uh, for international students. Plus the academic life itself, um, uh, the, the demands of the, uh, the program itself, um, the friends they make, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the reception they get in their classroom, their 
inability actually to open up and, and discuss the issues in the classroom because many uh, programs have got, or uh, many courses that have got class participation marks. And if you don't say anything at all in the class, then you don't get any points for that. So all of that kind of academic stuff um, is extremely sort of challenging for many international students, Indian international students, I would say, especially in the, in the, at the college level and at the undergraduate level. Now, another big, big uh, issue, again, we all know this, is the economic pressure. As I said, most uh, parents actually take loans or sell their property or do uh, have major, or uh, enter into major financial, uh, you know, financially significant arrangements in order to raise the money to send uh, their students home. So the pressure to kind of send the money home is very much on international students' uh, sort of mind. So they are allowed to work 20 hours per week outside their studies, but many of them end up doing much more work than they should. And therefore, um, therefore of course, jeopardizing their own academic career, uh, academic work. And I also see that they, um, they sometimes work um, under the table. And so they're paid uh, much less than the average uh, um, uh, uh, um, sort of as, as wages and the exploitation that they suffer in terms of overtime and all of that is extremely well known to everyone. So the economic pressure is a huge one. In fact, it has been also found that many of them are food insecure. In other words, they don't have enough money to buy food. And many of them talk about, um, talk about the fact that sometimes they skip meals, sometimes they depend on others, sometimes they kind of um, and literally go, uh, you know, sort of food, food insecurity is what we call um, uh, that. And then the third and the most important, um, uh, third is the sociocultural context and the issues there. Um, you find that, uh, uh, that international students, uh, okay. Okay, the international students have got lots of issues around the sociocultural environment they're coming to their modes of behavior, the ways of dressing, their uh, conversation, um, and then, you know, basic things that Canadians take for granted. The international students have to learn that social context and have the skills to sort of adjust to that. For example, I'm just giving a minor example. You know, say for example, in a classroom or some third the classroom, a number of students are having a conversation, a mixed group of students. In Canada, people wait for the other person to finish uh, before they jump in with this conversation, with their, their points or their conversation. Many international students do not really follow that or even understand that. They just, you know, sort of uh, uh, kind of jump into the conversation and sometimes that is seen as rude. So something which is so natural to them is now kind of defined as rude by, uh, by their classmates. And then, um, um, I have had a number of students just just defended uh, a student, an African um, student of African uh, origins, just descended his PhD uh, thesis on international students, especially coming from West Africa, Ghana, and Nigeria. There also the whole issue around the sociocultural acceptance that the students get, or the lack of acceptance, is a huge issue, and 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 along with that is sort of the discrimination they face. And many of them really don't realize it's discrimination, and some of them do realize it's discrimination on the basis of color, on the basis of language ability, on the basis of accents, but they all kind of experience that. Now, the third area of uh, major struggle for international students is service provision. What are they, uh, what do they get? What can they expect from their institutions and society at large? Now, the institutional context is an interesting one, simply because now almost all universities and colleges have got uh, international student offices. The issue is, and they have counselors, they have all kinds of people who can help them. The issue is how many international students go and actually uh, receive services from these places? And do they do enough of an outreach to the international student community um, particularly on the basis of their nationalities and so on, to offer culturally and 
and, and sensitive kind of services or even advice to these students. So that is a major concern. So having services itself is not enough, but outreach and actually reaching out to people who are in difficulty is the most important thing. And we all know that, you know, going to counseling is not necessarily on the minds of international students as they face difficulties. It is almost impossible for them to go to someone and say, I'm going through this difficulty. Okay, so I'll quickly finish yeah. that. Uh, and then um, I had actually uh, put in the, uh, so, so then there is this big gap between the students' expectations and, uh, and, and the reality of what is happening, resulting in a number of acculturative uh, stress symptoms and failure to achieve their objectives. Actually, I put in um, international student experience that was uh, the, a news item that came uh, about Mr. Bharadwaj and his, uh, 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 his services. And so I'm going to uh, skip that. So the issue here is, uh, okay, so what can we do? Is the most important thing we need to consider. One is to basically to provide social support networks. Whichever form that takes have to be figured out whether it is in the church groups or the, or the temple groups or the gurudwaras or whatever, or whether it is sort of the non-denomination, non-religious non kind of setups, whether you have the cultural organizations, or whether it is sort of, uh, you know, so a mentorship system that can kind of, you know, bring people together. Whatever ways is possible, the outreach to international Indian students have to happen uh, to provide social support. This is not to pretend that we know everything uh, and that we can advise you, we can solve your problems, no. It is actually to provide um, sort of support and connections. Through connections, they can actually reach out to different services, tangible assistance. Do you need a ride to such and such a place? Do you need you know, somebody to take you to a hospital if you have an issue? Now, um, and information and guidance. You know, many of us have uh, sort of the, the tendency to say, oh, I came here with $8 and therefore you can make it as well. No, that's not that reality right now. So we need to be sort of, not, instead of saying, oh, I know everything, our role has to be to refer these people to, to uh, these students, to people who know the issues, who, who will work in this area and to kind of provide that kind of connections and social networks. Role modeling helps. And there was always this positive feedback that we can provide saying that, okay, this is a difficult environment. This is a challenging environment, but you will definitely make it after all, you know, go through two years and then all of that. About more than 50 to 55% of the international students actually stay back in Canada, the Indian international students. And, and we really don't know the latest figures in the last two years. So they are all kind of intending to be permanent residents. So uh, to, to help them to make a success of their stay here, the education here, the community has a big role to play in terms of providing social support networks. I'm not talking about counseling, I'm not talking about, you know, sort of, I know it all kind of attitude, but giving, surrounding them with all kinds of support services so that, uh, so that they, can, they can become successes. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful presentation, uh, Usha ji. It's just that we were just a little bit over time, but I would still like to ask you two uh, quick questions. Right, right. Um, you know, if you can provide uh, some brief uh, answers uh, before we move to our next uh, speaker, Sandeep Rane. Um, so the first question is something that you touch based upon um, in your presentation, the cultural integration. You know that uh, students coming from India may not uh, know about the customs and uh, how people uh, conduct their lives in a Canadian perspective. So uh, can, can, can't this be done before the students come here, like, you know, right in India, before they come here, um, mm -hmm. either by the Canadian High Commission to educate them, you know, about uh, what to expect, how to live your life, uh, what is the Canadian way of life, things like that, either by the Canadian High Commission or by the institutions themselves to provide that kind of training in India before they come here? Oh, definitely. Actually, for, um, for immigrants who are coming to Canada, there is a pre-arrival orientation program, uh, which is provided by the Canadian High Commission. Um, we can think of something similar 
because um, the general guidelines that are given to a potential uh, 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 a uh, permanent resident is not the one that is to be given to our students. So we can think in terms of a package, an orientation package for international students um, uh, provided by the High Commission uh, or, or you know by the Indian High Commission, but I think the Canadian High Commission would be the right place to start. Yeah, and that's, I, what, that's what I meant, yeah. the Canadian High Commission. Right, 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 yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, and the second question is, you know, when, a, when an educational institution in Canada goes under, uh, like the one we recently saw in Quebec, creating a lot of problems for a lot of Indian students. You know, they were almost about to finish their courses. Now their degrees are in limbo. Their money is now stuck. Um, you know, they don't know where to go. Um, now they have to go to another uh, college or university. Do they have to pay all over again, which most uh, students won't be able to afford? So, uh, I mean, what kind of a recourse international students have in cases like that. And uh, when such an instance happens, are the other colleges and universities open to accepting them to allow them to finish their degrees? Um, uh, where do I start? Um, okay, um, first of all, uh, the pre-arrival preparation is the, is the most important one. You can only be proactive because when you choose colleges, when you choose universities, you have to literally look at their, their um, reputation. Mostly, uh, you know, the, 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 the government uh, supported institutions like, uh, you know, are, are, are quite safe, but it is the private colleges that one has to really check out uh, and see because oh, demand for education has become so big that private colleges have become a big business in itself. Um, I know um, in Australia, for example, there's a provider who has got all kinds of services, but totally private. So the international students, I mean, I don't know, we have to do a lot of outreach to say that you have to check out what before you come, before you even start applying, what kind of institution are you applying for to? What is their, uh, their uh, what are their credentials, the, the institutional credentials? Where do they stand in terms of the rankings um, of their uh, offering, so to speak. So that is one big thing that has to happen. Now, the question around when, you know, an international, uh, sorry, when a private college goes under, you know, can they be transferred? Yes and no. They can actually reapply to these institutions, uh, other institutions and continue their studies, but all of that involves money. The private institutions probably cannot reimburse the expenses that they have incurred during this process. So then that means there is much more money to be spent in order to kind of complete their education. That's the most uh, difficult uh, and heart-wrenching experience that uh, any international student and their families can have. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, it's an important issue that uh, you know we will continue to uh, seek answers for. Um, okay, so thank you for that, uh, for the presentation, for the answers, Kushaji. Um, and uh, we will look forward to working with you further uh, in, on this education sector. So let us move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Sandeep Rane. Um, Sandeep Rane has over 14 years of experience and achievements in Canadian post-secondary enrollment management goals, including eight years of leadership experience in international recruitment at Sheridan. The consultative career advisement based recruitment approach has been an integral part of international recruitment success at Sheridan. In addition to recruitment, Sandeep also collaborates within Sheridan and with external stakeholders to put in place support, support resources for international students like onboarding and in-country pre-departure events academic transition support with the help of library and learning services, financial support services, and community integration. With a career spanning two decades, both in public and private sectors within Canada and India, Sandeep has built his expertise in consultative sales, relationship management, business development, and partnerships. So over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, Vipulji. Uh, uh, Namaskar, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical issue here. So my uh, uh, laptop camera is not working. 
Um, I don't have any formal presentation as such. Uh, what I wanted to do was more of a uh, descriptive, interactive uh, session. I see um, Naga uh, from Seneca here with us today, so he can definitely join in. A uh, couple of things, when and mostly broadly when I'll speak, I'll keep uh, Sheridan context at large, but uh, we'll try to expand on um, international uh, Canada-wide uh, experiences of students as well. So when we talk about international students and support services, what we need to work on is expectations. And the expectation starts from the get-go when the student sends the inquiry or expresses the interest in your program at institutional level. Identifying whether you are a right fit for that student or whether the student is right fit for you. Uh, identifying what their career aspiration is, what is their motivation to come to Canada, what is the support system within India and within Canada that the student has. These things need to be explored and the support system will start here. Uh, most like all Canadian institutions and global institutions have identified this issue and have started putting up in-country representatives who are directly placed by the universities and colleges in India. So that is happening. So that's one thing that is going on. Uh, Seneca has an uh, international team in India. Ryerson has, or rather was looking for an uh, international representative to be placed in India. All other major universities and colleges have the in-country representatives in India. Sheridan has two in-country representatives in India, one who caters to the northern and eastern part of India and one who looks after the southern part of India. So the students have that access of real-time communicating directly with a university representative to get that information, to reach out and ask questions. So that facility is there. And as we progress towards from the application stage to the fee payment stage, there are pinpoints at or milestones at each level where the students are kind of provided the support, the information, the lookout that they require. Uh, Usha ji brought up a very good uh, uh, point over here about pre-departures. Are we really preparing students for our for transition or their studies in Canada, whether it's academic, whether it's social, whether it's uh, mental health issues related? So Sheridan has been doing pre-departure events since probably 2012, when our numbers were probably around 500 international students per intake. Today we have close to 2,000 international students per intake coming on. So before COVID, and we are actually planning our pre-departure for the fall intake right now, that's uh, gonna happen probably in July. We do our events in country in cities like Delhi, Jalandhar, Ludhiana, Chandigarh, Ahmedabad, Baroda, Mumbai, uh, Kochi, uh, Trivandrum, Chennai, and Hyderabad. And close to 800, 900 students attend these events in person uh, along with their parents. So it's not just the student transition that we work on on our pre-departures, but also extending that support to the parents. Because at end of the day, every parent, whether they are in India, whether they are in China, Australia, or even Canadian parent, they need to know that their kid is going to be taken care of when they're going to when they're going far away to study. So that's a crucial component. Um, what I feel is compared to universities, colleges have been ahead of the curve in these kind of activities because India has largely been till last few years dominated by the colleges with the two-year programs, with the two years and the three-year diploma programs. What the mentality in the past years 
for students to choose the diploma programs was return on investment. Rather than investing in a four-year university and spending close to 120,000, considering the tuition and the living expense, for a student who's looking at an ROI and a parent who's looking at an ROI, it makes economical sense to come for a two-year diploma program, get two to three years of work experience, become a permanent resident, become a domestic student, and then come back as a diploma degree pathway and complete their degree. And as a uh, domestic student, so the investment on getting a degree is far less. So that's, that's a different context that we can talk about. At Sheridan, we actually have set up an entire journey map right from the student applying to Sheridan till they register. That is the first um, uh, slab or the first stage of building up student experience. Then we have something called as first year experience. So every student, whether they are coming for a two-year diploma, whether they are coming for a four-year degree, or whether they have whether they are coming for a one-year postgrad certificate. Uh, there is a nurturing of what we call a first-year experience, so FYE experience. And there are series of sessions, communications, interactions inbuilt throughout the year to help them with the transition. So whether it's an academic. So Ushaji again brought up fantastic uh, uh, topic about plagiarism and academic integrity. So imagine a student who for last 14 years, 16 years, 12 years has been used to a certain academic uh, delivery mode, expecting them to change it overnight. It's a tough call. So whether it's plagiarism, whether it's referencing, uh, whether when you are doing presentations, Right, so those kind of training pieces, we actually have a set up uh, a learning module called as an academic integrity, where the students right from the stage of registration till the first month of um, their classes or the first term have to go through that process of understanding what does referencing actually means? What does academic integrity means? Um, uh, what does uh, plagiarism actually mean? We have students who are probably doing group study, uh, uh, group projects for the first time, and they are expected each one to individually submit their assignment, though it has been worked as a group, and to understand that concept for them can be daunting at times. So doing that. Then apart from that, we also have financial resources, on-campus jobs, scholarships, funding availability, uh, payment plans for the students to address the uh, financial resource uh, uh, availability for the students. The biggest challenge what we face, and uh, guy, uh, the, my counterparts might help me on this one, is what we need to get out of this psyche is not all Indian students are same. Not all stu Indian students have the same requirements, right? Uh, a student coming from Punjab or Gujarat has a different set of support system. And again, this is in Sheridan context because we are in Brampton and Mississauga, which has a very strong um, South Indian, um, I mean, uh, Punjabi population. So for these students, the network, the support system within the community, the, the, the contacts and connections are already there. Our biggest challenge comes is to identify students who are coming from Odisha, so students who are coming from Assam, um, the students who are coming from Pondicherry, uh, students who are coming from Daman and Diu, how do we get them into that community integration mode? So we actually uh, have a student-led initiative, which is um, Indian Student Association, ISA. This is a fully Indian student-run body 
they have their own election system, they have their own mechanism system. Uh, their role is to integrate all the new coming students into a Canadian setup. So whether it's taking them for a two year, a two days trip to Montreal, uh, or taking them for a winter fest in Quebec City, or Ottawa trip, all those pieces, as simple as taking them for, um, uh, what would call, oh my God, I'm forgetting the uh, ice hockey game, a hockey game, because that's something which is a big thing. We also have. Uh, uh, it's not formal, but cricket leagues. So there is uh, cricket is a very integral part for Indian students. So we have uh, cricket teams of different faculties that are on campus. On at our Brampton campus, uh, you'll see during summer students having their own matches on our grounds. So those pieces are there. What needs to be done is working with students to make them realize that the services are there for students. All they need to do is ask. And this is what we cover in each of our sessions, whether it's a prayer departure, whether it's an orientation, whether it's international festival. To tell the student that if you don't ask, the answer is no. To give you an example, so uh, during pandemic season, uh, I'm sorry, the season is a wrong word. Uh, during pandemic, we had a high number of students who were in uh, Canada, who were registered in programs, doing their programs online. And Sheridan had put out bursaries for students who were finding it challenging to have their, um, what do you call, uh, off-campus jobs and to pay for them. So institutionally Sheridan had set out some money for students, for these students to apply for those fundings. It became so daunting that the team had to reach out every student by call and asking them to apply for these kind of funding because students are not in habit of checking out the emails that are coming to them until and unless someone is providing them with information, it's becoming a lot more daunting. And again, I, I'm generalizing this. It's not happening with every student. With all the challenges that our international students face, what I'm proud to say is Indian students are graduating with higher grades. They are becoming uh, um, valedictorians of their classes. Uh, Indian students at Sheridan are getting nominated for the co-op students of the year. They are getting as uh, is selected as co-op student of the year in Ontario. So there are a couple of pieces here then to reaffirm. Resources throughout institutional level are provided. Some institutions, some colleges and universities may be ahead of the path. Some may be just tramping up because they are now seeing the influx of Indian students. But um, overall, the pieces are there. Probably more integration and communication is required. Uh, I'll close with that. If you guys have any questions, any uh, comment, I'll be happy to take that. Sure, absolutely. Um, most of my life, I have been uh, a media person, a journalist. So even if you wake me up at 2.30 at night, I will still have a few questions. Absolutely. Right. Perfect. All right. So two quick questions for you. Yes. Um, first is uh, now that uh, this term is almost now over uh, and we are now looking at the fall uh, semester. Yes. So are we still looking at the hybrid learning or uh, completely remote learning or now completely back in class? So that's, that's our biggest challenge that we have to face right now because IRCC has allowed online remote learning only till 31st of August. Um, for us, the biggest challenge is how the visa approval processing will happen. That mm -hmm. would dictate the... Uh, learning uh, delivery mode. Our goal is to for fall on campus because we understand the challenges 
the international students face, the time zone differences, the internet availability, uh, the support challenges in terms of academic support and learning support. So we get that. Uh, right now, unfortunately, when we look at the fall intake, delivery mode will be dictated by A, what the uh, situation in Ontario would be. I mean, I'm talking about Ontario colleges, uh, what the provincial guidelines would be around uh, uh, reopening colleges and campus accessibility. It will depend largely on uh, how the Canadian High Commission will process the um, study permits. So based on that, though we are keeping our fingers crossed, though we are hoping that our uh, uh, students will have opportunity to be on campus and have the first-hand experience, uh, probably by August, we would be able to declare the mode of delivery for fall intake. Okay. Um, the second question is, uh, in light of the cost of living going up considerably, um, you know, for all of us, are the colleges and universities, I mean, I'm not sure if you are the uh, right person to address this, or is this going beyond the purview of the colleges and universities? Is this for the government to take a call? But I'm just going to put it out here anyway. Yes. Um, yes. Are the colleges and universities open to allowing international students to work more hours, you know, more than 20 hours, so yeah. that they can pay their bills instead of working yeah. under the table, you know, working for $10 in cash, things like Ab that. Absolutely, absolutely. So there are two pieces here, Vipulji, that we need to address. Uh, one is definitely we do understand uh, the cost of living that is going high. We do understand the financial challenges that our inter uh, international students face. And this is one of the reasons, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm more we will speak about in um, share it in context, uh, and I'm sure um, other institutions are also doing the same thing. Sheridan has actually put in place a scholarship for uh, all international students across the board, uh, mm -hmm. whether they're coming for a diploma program, whether they're coming for a degree program, whether they're coming for a postgrad program, they all get a um, $1,000 scholarship. Uh, we also have instituted special scholarship for Indian students coming for specific programs. So for those programs, the scholarship fund has gone to $2,000. We have also expanded the on-campus work opportunities, the work for learn opportunities for international students. So the 20 hour work week that you're talking about is off campus. Yeah. If a student is working on campus, then they have extended number of hours. So that's there. Second thing is the 20 hour work week is only when the student is studying. When they are on official break or between the terms, they are allowed to work full time provided they are registered in course. So mm -hmm. that, that piece is already there. Extending more hours to work would be challenging for a student because at end of the day, we have to look at their study life balance as well, right? Because on an average, an international student is studying full time. So they are already uh, studying for 42 hours a week. Plus they need uh, their time to do their assignments, their classwork, their midterms, their projects, their finals. So that's there. We also understand that all work and no play made Jack a dull boy or Jill a dull girl. So we need to kind of have that fine balance of understanding when we say blanketly that allow them more hours to work, it may not actually work in their favor if it's going to impact their health, if it's going to impact their academic standing in the program. So those are the pieces we really need to address. Financially, yes, it's taken care of. We also have uh, programs in places for students who are uh, financially deprived. So there are financially bursaries available that the students can apply for. There are payment plans that the students can apply for. So institutionally, there are many pieces in place 
But as I said, if you don't ask, the answer is no. Right? Sure. So yeah, the student enough. needs to come for foul. Absolutely. Fair enough. So um, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy to now be connected with you. Um, you. Our next speaker, according to the agenda, was uh, Jacinda Panvit, uh, who through his company One Place uh, does a fantastic job in bringing Indian students to Canada and also finding suitable jobs for them. Uh, however, um, our next speaker after him, uh, Anupama, has another event to go to. So there's some a slight adjustment here in the speaker uh, sequence, and I'll bring in uh, Anupma first. Later on, I would love to bring all the uh, speakers together, you know, maybe reach out to you uh, and connect them to each other so we can uh, work on, uh, you know, making life easier for uh, students from India. So let me introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Anupma uh, Sharma uh, Srijik. She has spent over 20 years in the not for profit sector the labor movement and uh, empowerment coaching. Anu, as she is more commonly known, is currently the director of SUNO and a former president of Punjabi Community Health Services. She has been instrumental in assisting international students over the past few years in different capacities. Uh, SUNO is the brainchild of Anu, as uh, she is very passionate about bringing a change in the lives of international students. Uh, for more information, you can visit their website sunocharity.com. So over to you, Anupma. Thank you so much, Vipul Ji, and thank you, everyone. Um, this is great that you're doing this uh, discussion. I think it's much needed. Um, Kamal Bardwaj is actually um, on this call too. So just in case I have to jump off, he'll be more than glad to answer some questions. Um, you know, we are sort of a different context than the rest of the panelists because we're not an educational institution, but we are an organization that is providing services to the students that are connecting with us through various um, various forms. Um, we have been doing a, a series of a webinar series since 2020 um, in India. So we wanted to actually have conversations with students prior to them even thinking about coming to Canada. Um, Interesting enough, uh, we, we decided what's the gap? What's happening with the students? Where is the information breakdown happening with them once they get here? So we thought, okay, let's sort of reinvent the wheel and have conversations with them, provide them with the resources, the context, even before they think, before they've applied, before they've done their eyelids. So we have been doing webinar series um, throughout, throughout India. And we have three series um, that we've invited parents to be a part of. It's been very, um, very well received. And we've had a lot of students connect with us uh, via LinkedIn, emails, even calls um, about having some supports before they get here. Um, one question that I always ask the students that we've connected with was, was someone there to pick you up from the airport when you got here? Um, a lot of the times the students have said no. So the first, the first sort of um, impression that they have of Canada is a sense of loneliness and abandonment. So we didn't want that to happen. We wanted to switch the narrative. Um, you know, we've had conversations with students that have said, you know, um, we were told that this is what was going to happen, but the opposite happened, et cetera. So we wanted to, to let them know that we will do our best to provide them with whatever resources that we can, but we personally vetted people. We don't want students to get the wrong impression, to think that everyone is sort of there to, to take advantage of them, to, you know, to manipulate them, et cetera. We want to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with folks whose heart's in the right place. Oh, sorry. It's my Bluetooth. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, I, I, I do appreciate um, hearing some of the panelists speak. Like Sandeep Ji from Sheridan, you know, we've also documented the student's journey. And, you know, I feel like we're all doing a lot of the same work, um, but we don't get opportunities like this to connect with one another. Um, I do give credit when credit's due. When people get to know me, they'll know that I, I do this quite frequently. Um, I had the pleasure of connecting with Tamara at the beginning of the year when the Council General of India had put together a similar sort of discussion. Since then, Tamara is and Ancestor College is the first college to get um, 
to get and understand the work that Sano is doing. And they've given us the platform to hold a networking session for the students that go to that college. So I do want to say that, you know, we've been trying to connect with the community as a whole since 2019. And a hats off to Tamara Ancestor College for realizing that the work that we're doing and to realize the impact um, that the student for the students. Since this connection, since I've had a chance to connect with the students there, we've been giving them mental health counseling. We've been supporting them, just even having a, a familiar space or a friendly person to talk to or text on the other end makes such a difference. Um, and you know, we as Sano came together because we started to realize that some of the students were falling through the cracks. And um, unfortunately, the reason why we came together was because of the mental health issues that were happening within the students, the addictions. And Kamal is the owner of Lotus Funeral Home. So he's had the unfortunate role of having to, to do the funerals for these students. So we wanted to make sure that this doesn't get to the point where the, we are having this conversation more and more about these suicides happening. So we wanna prevent it. Um, Vipul G and Tejas, you know, this sort of conversation connects us with folks and it's in, in a way that we don't get a chance to, and especially with the virtual world. So I, I wanted to say thank you for giving us the platform. Um, but also I think it's really important that, you know, we're having this conversation here in the GTA, but conversations are coming up about the folks outside in different provinces, right? So I think, you know, with IMAC and the folks that are on this call, it would be great to talk about how we're implementing models and doing things here and supporting other colleges, other universities, potentially other organizations that are dealing and facing the same sort of issues, the same sort of barriers that students are facing and how we can support one another. Um, it's, it's great to continue these conversations. And, it, and I think, the more we work together collectively, the more I think it'll be, so it'll be give such a positive light to our students prior to them coming here. Um, you know, we've had a lot of students like we we're talking about, Sandeepji was talking about plagiarism. So, you know, that's part of one of our webinar series. Um, so students are like, what's plagiarism? So before they get here, we are already having that conversation. Additionally, what Sano, Sano's model is, so a lot of the students, that we have are peer mentors. We have about 25 students that we've trained as peer mentors that there were international students themselves. And I think that's important because, you know, I'm Canadian born. I will never understand the struggles that an international student's gone through, but because these students have been through there, it's a familiar face. It's a friendly face. They can relate, they can support them. And I think culturally appropriate makes a huge difference as well. So, you know, our, our peer mentors are very active, social media, a lot of the times when someone calls where they have some counseling or they have some things that they wanna talk about, I refer them to our peer mentors. And um, collectively, Gummel, myself and Erwin, who's a third co-director for Sano, two to five years, we don't wanna be the face of this organization. We want the students to be running this organization. And um, I think for the future, cohorts, the future years and the graduates of the different colleges and universities, these students will at least have a broader sort of camaraderie and connection with the community. So I'm there, I can talk for days about the work that Suno is doing, um, but I, I can answer questions if, if anyone has. And um, Gamal, I'm not sure if I missed anything, if you wanted to jump in and share something that I've missed. You know, um, there are many things that uh, I, we didn't really talk, we talk about education, but the international students and that, but there's a lot of things that you like human trafficking. Um, that is, is a big area as well. Um, Anu knows and I know that you see sometimes in a week, five girls will come in pregnant and um, it, it's a terrible situation that's going on. So this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to some of the topics, but there are many even more terrible things that are at play. Uh, money laundering, another one. Um, just to name a, a couple right there. Sure. Yeah. So I will ask one question each, one to, uh, to Anupma and one to Kamaji, uh, because Anupma has to leave by 11.30. So Anupma, you work extensively on uh, issues like abuse, exploitation, et cetera, 
um, as Kamalji just uh, mentioned. Do you see the situation getting better now because of more awareness on it or the situation becoming worse because of the pandemic and the financial challenges that the students face? Vipulji, wonderful question. And I was trying not to talk too much about some high risk topics. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's getting worse, to be quite honest. And you financially, the pandemic, but also I think there's another component that I sort of touched on, but I will, I'll be very transparent that I feel like the work that we're doing, we're doing in tandem to provide support for the students, but also provide awareness for the community. Yeah. So a lot of the community might not be aware of the sex trafficking, the human trafficking and all these other things that are happening. Um, so we're, we're doing this and maybe shaking some, ruffling some feathers, but I feel that because of the pandemic, um, a lot of the students, and I'm not just going to say female students, but male students too, are, are trying to figure out how to make ends meet, right? We know that 20 hours isn't enough off of campus. So I feel that a lot of these issues that are affecting them are, are getting worse. And, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of the students, some I know that graduated without every, having to step foot in a class. So you think about spending $30,000 roughly coming here and not getting the chance to get the same, like getting the experience of in a classroom, meeting other folks. So they've literally been in their room. And the only people that they're connecting with might be their roommates or other folks. So now that, you know, campuses are opening up, now that people are interacting, I feel like the mental health conversations are not going to happen as often because they know that there's resources to help them. But I feel that the conversation needs to happen about which culturally appropriate services are there for them, right? So campuses, colleges are doing a fantastic job. But I feel like the conversation might happen. Are they culturally appropriate? Are they speaking Hindi, Punjabi, Gujarati, whatever the languages are? Mm -hmm. If they're not, how can we how can we kind of form allyship with organizations that are doing that? So these students know that there's people helping them to get out of get out of these uh, issues that they're facing. OK, so thank you for the fantastic work you are doing. It is much needed and is extremely helpful, actually. Um, you know, people who do not face these issues will never understand the, you know, how important this kind of uh, assistance is. Uh, people that do actually need this kind of support uh, will absolutely thank you for their life, uh, you know, for the, for the assistance that they are getting from you. So we need more uh, people like you. And thank you for, for the job you are doing. And Kamalji also. Uh, Kamalji, my next question is for you as part of um, I can see Tamara, you know, and not see it. Uh, so, um, Tamaji, you have been part of Suno. You have been uh, supporting this, uh, you know, uh, help uh, and other assistance. And through your Lotus Funeral Home, you have also been uh, providing the funeral services. Um, you have been working extensively in repatriating bodies of Indian students uh, who pass away here uh, back to India. In terms of the impact on their families back home, you know, who may have borrowed huge sums of money, mortgage their houses, their farms, uh, you know, uh, do everything possible to send their uh, son or daughter here. So in terms of the impact on their families back home, can you help us understand, you know, this process and the, the challenges uh, that you face, uh, their families back home face, and the support the community provides? in situations like that? Well, it's very tragic, obviously. Um, to give you some stories, for example, um, the impact on some of these families, and this is getting very common. And this was sort of the tipping point why I wanted to you know, work with Anu, you know, Suno and get this organization going was when there was a case where there was this uh, family and their loved one passed away and fortunately was suicide. And the uh, parents who were very elderly went actually on a hunger strike. They did not want to eat anything until their son arrived back in India. So, and we are pleading with the family, don't do that because, you know, it can take a number of days and we don't want anybody to go through, you know, something like that because that's going to obviously 
make them go through uh, you know physical hardships to to go on a hunger strike until their loved one comes. So so imagine you know putting yourself in a parent situation, losing your your child, and they didn't believe that was their child until they came and they saw it, and that's why they didn't want to eat anything. So the challenge is to get them there quickly as possible. So um, if something happens uh, on a Friday night and the government offices are closed and they can only open on Monday, so we've lost already a couple of days, right? Because there are provincial governments involved and in getting certain documentation. Um, and I thank you uh, for all the work that the uh, Indian Consulate Office does because they facilitate the documentation that, as part of the process as well. And they work very uh, quickly, efficiently to you know, help us along the way. Uh, but there's different government agencies in, in Canada involved and all this does take time, right? And we have to book flights and so forth and that. So the challenges for the families is just the waiting of that. The emotional support that they have is whoever's around them locally. Um, recently, there have been some uh, people have been approaching us and saying, you know, we've been hearing more about the news. Uh, for example, the young man who was shot uh, downtown Unfortunately, we had to bring him back to, uh, to India and there was uh, a number of people wanted to help the family, reach out to the family. So, you know, there are good people in Toronto and GTA that want to get involved and help. Um, but obviously, if you, if you want to give emotional support, you just can't be just giving like that. There, there are professionals that are more geared towards to do that. So it's just not meant for everybody and, uh, you know, things like that. So that's some of the challenges that are facing right now are just the time delays. And during the pandemic, that was difficult because of some countries were shutting down and airports were shutting down or, you know, and so that became challenging as well. But we're through that now. Right, and hopefully uh, these cases will now uh, decline, you know, as we open up more, um, as there's more awareness about the issues um, in the broader community, you know, among the students also, um, right, because I think your job is, uh, and our job rather, not your job, our job, is, is to not only to reach out to the community, but also to reach out to the students themselves, uh, to tell them about the help, you know, where, where they can find it, what kind of help they can find it, um, and that they are not alone, they are not helpless. You know, they are in Canada, but Canada is now almost, you see so many Indian people here, Indian community origin people here, you know, that they are part of the family. Uh, and uh, there are people that they can go to. So that's uh, that's uh, our job. That's what we collectively need to do. And I thank both of you, you and Anupma, for doing the amazing job uh, that you are doing for uh, for students. Um, so with that, uh, let us now go to our next uh, speaker, Jatinder Banwit. Um, we are running about 15 minutes uh, behind the schedule. So my apologies for that, Jatinder Ji. Uh, after Jatinder, we'll go to Tamara and then uh, Nagasra. Uh, so uh, Jatinder Banwet is a uh, technopreneur with uh, 20 years of experience delivering innovative technology solutions to customers across the globe. His uh, latest venture, oneplace.ca, is a one-stop education platform that enables international students to search and apply for courses online for many reputable Canadian colleges and universities. The platform will seamlessly connect the students and educational institutions directly across the globe, enabling a transparent and faster efficient admission process. The One Place platform also provides a unified view to all the major stakeholders in the admission process, like the students, colleges, and immigration consultants uh, together. One Place also offers job placements for qualified students through their in-house recruitment programs. He possesses a master's degree in mathematics and is an avid cricketer. So uh, over to you, Jitinderji. Uh, thank you, Vipuli. Thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, so I will give, I have, I think, 10 minutes, so I will try to be on point as much as I can. Uh, so One Place, uh, as uh, everyone knows, what are the issues we are facing, whether it's uh, Usha, you mentioned, whether Sandeep Rane mentioned, uh, whether Anu G mentioned. So everyone, I think we know what are the main issues we are seeing, uh, you know, from, from day one, uh, when the student starts journey from, uh, from India or from any other country. Uh, but the question is that all those issues are there, but how we can solve those issues? We are discussing about, you know, these are issues are there, but how it can be solved uh, one by one. 
uh, are we doing enough to solve those issues? Uh, as an ed tech, ed tech company on our side, we can do, you know, certain portion, um, you know, we can smooth the journey of the student from day one, uh, you know, to give the right information to the student if he needs to come to the Canada, you know, we can give the information about courses, you know, we can align what courses they need to take, they need to take and what, uh, you know, skill set they need to be aligned down the road. So we can give all that information and we are doing that one as, you know, free of cost. We're not charging any, any cost to any of the students in India. Uh, but the thing is that while coming here, as I mentioned, there are three, Usha, you mentioned three different points, right? That those, I think those three points cover pretty much all the issues what we are seeing. Migration, migration is number one. So when the people, students, they come over here, what kind of orientation we are giving to them? Uh, Pre-arrival orientation is good. You give, you will give once, and you know, yes, they 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 complete it. But if you look at it in marketing perspective, uh, if you need to sell anything or if you need to show to someone, you need to sh show those seven seven times that similar thing so that a person will remember. Hey, this is what I need to do, or this is the the brand, or this is the marketing marketing we need to do. Uh, we are also in uh, job placements, as I mentioned uh, in my portfolio. We work with a lot of banks here. And they have the a kind of uh, uh, rule or restriction, you can say that every month, each their employee has to go through a laundry you know, act or they have to see uh, what they cannot do or what they can do. So there's a kind of orientation program for each employee for each you know, in different banks. I think similar thing we can do, uh, we are saying you know, Consulate General is doing or Canadian High Commission is doing, I think uh, colleges can take that step one step further that rather than doing the pre orientation along with that, they should do a, some kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, a compuls compulsory course for them, a compulsory training for them once a month or once a quarter. Hey, guys, you need to go through. If you won't pass it, you can move on. Uh, if, even in Canada, if you look, you know, even if you do any courses, if you do anything, they will give you a kind of a pre-test guys do this one if you don't know you need to go back and refer you know those those points so i think that will help big time to the students that actually how they can uh, you know after the migration how they can be a part of the you know culture and Canadian culture what they can do what they cannot do just to remind them again and again see they as mentioned they are you know very in they're coming in very such uh, you know tender age you need to remind them, guys, this is what needs to be done. This is the way it is. So if you remind them again and again every month as a part of their you know, curriculum, I think they will adapt that one uh, very easily rather than just doing in the you know, first, first time or you know, before, the, uh, before the arrival. That's one aspect. Second aspect is, uh, uh, you mentioned about the mortgage, right? A lot of people are selling their lands in the back home and uh, they're giving that money so that they, the you know, students or their children can come. As I have another suggestion for ICIC Bank that they are internationally recognized, right? Why they, why can't they come up with a such, you know, uh, a kind of a loan program for those students uh, in Canada? We, for Canadian st students, we have an OSAP, you know, uh, recently a company called Sophie, they launched in the US. Uh, 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 government is also sponsoring in the US for, for uh, you know, for students to give them a loan. So Sophie is a new company which they introduced to give a loan to even international students also. So similar thing can be done, I think, in, uh, in Canada through ICIC banks or some international banks through international banks where they can actually come up with the option. Although they have the collateral back home, they know they have this kind of you know, uh, money available. So at least based on that, they can give the loan over there. So they don't need to sell it right away in India and they don't need to give that you know, big amount of money right away in the first place. So where they need to, you know, again, they need to struggle. So once they will... When they sell their property or those things, then the students whoever is coming to Canada, pressure is on him that how he can recover that money and send it back. That's why students are uh, doing a lot of random jobs. You know, uh, 20 hours is perfect you know, time that you can do the most, but most of the students I have seen, they are doing 20 hours legally, but they are also doing a lot of illegal work on cash. Uh, because reason for that, because they can't meet their both hands and they have to send the money back to India. Uh, so I have another, I was thinking, you know, uh, another side for that one, that 20 hours is set for that one, but why can't we add, or maybe colleges can put such a way that, hey, within your course, 20 hours, you can 
you can do the work to earn the money, but maybe 10 hours extra, for example, it has to be attached with your course related uh, you know, experience, whether it's a, a volunteer job for two hours here or for four hours there. So at least they can go in their own line rather than looking for odd jobs. And then they're struggling even after two years or three years after their course to get a job in, in Canada, because end of the day, they're not looking for the right, uh, right courses or right uh, jobs in that side. Uh, we did a lot of POCs with different colleges. We are a part of Capstone Project for Sheridan. Um, I think Sheridan is doing a good job from, especially in the Capstone Project where they are giving uh, a lot of uh, right experience to the students. Um, and uh, based on those students, they are actually uh, getting the getting the jobs of the down the road. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I think the real struggle starts with the students when they need to look for the job. Uh, you know, you you can get the money from India, you can finish your course, you can do twenty other jobs and all those things. But what's after that? You know, you finish your course, what is the next? Will you get a job or not? I think that is the key point which we are missing, uh, where they need to align with the specific job skill set what they need to need to go. And I think that will that is missing from day one because the students who are coming from India, their main mandate is to land into in Canada and you know try to be to get a PR regardless you know by by hook or crook whatever the way they just want to land in Canada and get the PR. So in order to that achieve PR they don't focus on their studies properly uh, or they don't choose the right courses on that side. Uh, after three years, they will struggle and then they will start looking for some employers to sponsor the LMI or, you know, to give the money to some employers. Hey, can you give me the LMI so that I can be, uh, I can be, you know, a permanent or I can get the, a further citizen on that one. So job, I think a lot of, a uh, lot of colleges are helping in that scenario. They are, reaching out to different call, uh, different uh, employers, different employ, uh, different companies. But I think we need to take a little bit one step more that how uh, every student in each college can, can go in the right direction from the studies perspective and can get the job in their, you know, in their, uh, in their area so that they can, it will be easier for them down the road to settle down in Canada rather than struggling at the last minute and you know going through mental stress and going through you know financial issues. So that's on my side, guys. That's that's my my two cents. What I've I felt in. Sure. Thank you for uh, for that uh, unique perspective. Actually, uh, because you deal with students directly, so you know the challenges that they face in terms of the education loan that you touched base upon. I believe banks are providing education loans in India very very aggressively. I don't know if that qualifies for uh, foreign institutions also or only for studies within India. Uh, you know, that is something that we can discuss with the bank. Yes, true, Vipulji. But for example, any international bank like ICIC or HDFC, they have the rules pretty much everywhere, right? So they yeah, can yeah. have the collateral as whatever it is in India. And then yeah. they can give the money in Canada for those students. It will be on true. lower interest rate, lower thing. In India, it's around 8 or 9%, which is pretty high. If you yeah. come to Canada, it's low. So, so you know, again, every every department or every step, what in the whole journey, everyone has to take you know their own kind of role to to help them out. Definitely, they need help, students. There's no issue. Students uh, must need some you know help from from every from every point of view. Sure. So the uh, last quick question for you before we move to Tamara, who has been waiting patiently. Thank you for that. Um, if, do you, in terms of the interest? Um, as you mentioned, you know, some of the students are only looking at staying back in Canada, you know, education is, may not be their first priority. Um, so do you see a preference in terms of provinces? I mean, obviously, Ontario and BC would be more preferred destinations because of the um, large Indo-Canadian diaspora. But now Saskatchewan, Yukon, other provinces are also aggressively reaching out. Uh, they all want a piece of that, uh, you know, pie. Um, do you see Indian students now panning out all across Canada? They are, see, a lot of students, what we, we do a lot of seminars in India and different provinces uh, in India also. Uh, what we are getting from different students, their first preference is, as you mentioned, to get a PR or to get settled. But at the same time, some students, they don't have the money. Uh, to support even further, right? There are a lot of other people, students, they have some money, they can go to those states, 
uh, whether it's the Yukon, whether it's the New Brunswick, but the jobs are not available for them over there. Uh, uh, even the odd jobs are not available because not a lot of businesses are there. So people are, the people who have money or students who have money in India, they are preferring to go to you know, those uh, remote areas where they can get the PR quickly. Uh, for a, even for a year, if they need to spend you know thirty thousand dollars extra to support themselves, they will do it because they have the money. But the students who they don't have money, who are selling their you know uh, land or putting getting mortgages on their houses, their preference is to come to either BC or to Canada, uh, sorry to BC or to Ontario or some places on uh, in Montreal because at least they can get the job over there and then they can twenty hours there and then they can do odd jobs also. So at least they can get the money and they can send the money back to their parents or to whoever they are, they are, they are borrowing from them. Okay, sure. Um, so thank you for, for that. Thank you for participating. Let us now move to our remaining two speakers. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Tamara Eswick uh, from Sister College. <clears throat> Tamara is a student services advisor and a regulated international student immigration advisor at uh, Sister College, Lambton College in Toronto. Uh, she works with a student population of 6,000 plus international students from all over the world and provides academic and personal advisement and referrals to students ranging from GPA requirements to referrals to mental health support. She has over 10 years experience in social service work, including advocating for, empowering and providing marginalized populations with access to training, education and employment. Tamara has established numerous connections across various sectors, industries, and with for-profit and non-profit organizations to provide opportunities for clients and students to become successful. So over to you, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vipul and Tejas, for this opportunity to present um, my experience working with international students in my role as a student services advisor at Sester College slash Lambton College in Toronto. I just wanna make the distinction with uh, the institution that I work with. It's a private public or public private partnership between uh, Lambton College that's based out of Sarnia and Sester College that is based out of Toronto. 100% um, of our student population is international students. So our campus in Toronto serves international students. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, our campus has 6,000 plus students. Uh, all of them are international students. 90 plus percent of our student population is from India. Um, and the rest are, are from 44 other countries around the world. I have a unique perspective to provide you all um, in terms of the struggles, the challenges, the issues that the international students at our college face. Um, so I work with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, whenever they're dealing with any issues having to do with their academics or their personal lives. Um, I have also mentored and counseled many students who have ex experienced um, suicidal ideation due to the stresses it is that they've experienced being international students within the Canadian context. Um, a lot of the students are very, very young and it's the first time that they have traveled outside of their homes. And so trying to adapt quickly to a new environment um, pro proposes a lot of challenges such as homesickness, um, depression, anxiety, um, and particularly due to the pandemic where education has transferred from in-person to online, the justification, as many of the panelists have discussed earlier, the justification of paying $30,000 plus for education for it to be online starts to creep doubt into their minds and really question their decision as to whether or not it was worth um, coming to Canada because what they're being sold is not what they're receiving. So they're being told, you know, you can become global citizens, come to Canada, you get access to people from all around the world in the Canadian, great Canadian education, and they get here and everything's online. They have technical glitches because maybe their, you know, internet connection is slow. They need to ask questions and they're more comfortable asking questions in person than online because there's that disconnect. So 
there's so many issues at play when it comes to the experience of international students. There have been many instances where I've had to speak to students, particularly in Indian students, about their struggles. Many of them have said to me, you know what, Tamara, I'm so stressed out, I want to quit or I want to take my life because I have pressures back home from my family who want me to work and send money. I'm living here in Canada where rent is so high. My landlord is taking advantage of me because I'm living in a house with 10 other people and I'm sharing all of these things and I can't focus because there's noise all over the place. I have exams to study for, I have work to do. Plus I'm only able to work 20 hours a week off campus. That's not enough to pay rent. That's not enough to pay for food. That's not enough to socialize and have you know, some kind of school work-life balance. All of these stresses compound to the point where many of the students say, you know what, it's easier not living than to deal with these stresses. And that is sad. As someone who is Canadian born, who has never had to go through the international student experience, I could only imagine how that feels. And especially when you're coming from a country where your mother tongue is different than English, um, and you're, you are kind of forced to speak to someone who may not know your culture, may not know your language, may not know, you know your experiences. These are some of the challenge I, challenges I do to face with some of the students because they may not want to be so open to share certain things with me. And I understand. So as a new, um, and Kamal were stating the importance of having cultural supports where students can access supports in their language in their culture, having the community understand the wants and needs of international students and the respect that they deserve because they contribute so much to our economy and so much to our culture as a whole in Canada is quite important. Um, so the things that I've tried to, to provide the students in terms of supports is connecting with organizations such as Suno Canada. Um, which has been amazing. And, and, and the student feedback has been very, very positive in the types of supports and mentorships that they received from a news organization and the peer mentors that she spoke of. Um, it's so tragic to hear on a weekly basis, it seems as if, you know, a lot of international students are facing, you know, tragic demises. And, and to know that I work in that in, in the sector of supporting international students and I can't do enough, it, it, it pains me a lot. And as someone who is not part of uh, the Indian community, but I have connections and I'm working with students and I'm learning so much, I think it's imperative that the international student experience starts in India. It starts with the agents. It starts with agents not taking advantage. There are good agents, but there are some agents who take advantage of the students and, and not giving them the information that they need in order to be successful. Um, it starts with educating you know, parents and students of the Canadian education experience and what they should expect, such as you know, academic, academic integrity, plagiarism, um, you know, how to write an assignment, how to study for exams and tests, things like that, very, very important. Because what happens is, you know, some of the panelists mentioned, the main reason a lot of the students come to Canada is because they want to become PRs and eventually cit Canadian citizens. And they negate the aspect of their responsibilities as international students then they forget to look at their, their study permits to see when they expire. They, they forget to look at their courses and know the GPA that is required for them to graduate because they're dealing with so many things. The supports need to be all over the place. So, um, so I'm working as hard as I can to connect with organizations. If there's anyone here who would like to connect with me offline, um, I'm more than happy to connect with you. And uh, Vipul and Tejas, you can definitely share my contact details as well. Um, and so just before I go, because I know time is important, um, some of the things that I'd like to recommend in order to make uh, international students' experiences uh, you know, a little bit more manageable here is the importance of advocating for um, their, their rights to be known as well as perhaps work, having more work hours rather than working 20 hours a week off campus, and a lot of the jobs are, are minimum wage, 
we can advocate for an increase. Yes, you have a study permit in order to study in Canada, but you also have to live. And some of the needs are not being met because of the pay that the students are, are getting and which results to under the table work, which is quite dangerous. So um, I'm just gonna stop here because there's so much more that I can share, but I know that time is limited and, and we have another panelist to speak. So thank you again so much for allowing me to use this platform to share my experience as well as to advocate on behalf of international students, in particular Indian students who need all the supports they can get. And I'm willing to, to do as much as I can to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. It was a very passionate uh, remarks. We can see the passion, the emotion, you know, in your remarks. And uh, you touch base upon almost every issue that the international students face. Um, as you have seen, I have tried to touch base upon almost all of them in my opening remarks and in the questions that I have been asking to the speakers. So definitely we would love to connect with you uh, after uh, this uh, session, sometime later on, you know, next month. Um, and uh, I'm sure Jatinder would also love to meet with you. Um, so I have got one quick question for you uh, before we move to our last uh, speaker, uh, Nagasarat. Um, with many Canadian colleges and universities now doing direct outreach and marketing in India, uh, what difference does it make for the students themselves? And are these institutions now open to collaborate further, you know, with agencies, with agents, um, to make it easier, you know, more beneficial for the students by working side by side with the agents? I think that's a wonderful question to ask. And I think that it's imperative on um, educational institutions. If you are recruiting students from around the world, you need to do the work to educate um, the students or prospective students and their parents. Um, it's not about, it shouldn't be about making money in my opinion. Yes, education is, is for profit and international students bring in a lot of money, but it's your responsibility to ensure that once they become your students, that you provide them with the supports that they need. It's not about money. And, and unfortunately, I think that's where a lot of institutions get caught up in is the profit. But where the human, there's a human being behind that money, right? And that needs to be taken into account. So I can only speak on what my college is doing, which is training staff, ensuring that they are culturally aware, ensuring that they are providing the supports that they need once the students get here when it comes to housing, food access, um, you know, information on their rights. You have as much rights as I do as a Canadian when you are here because you are allowed to be here. Of course, you can't vote. Of course, there's certain things that you can't do, but we have access to the same kind of rights when it comes to employment, et cetera. These things need to be, um, you know, taught. And, and, and this is what we're doing here at our college. I'm not sure what other institutions are doing, but I think it's imperative that if we are asking people to come study here, that we provide them with the supports. It's not about let's make money. It's about there's a human being that has had to do a lot of work to get that money. So we'll allow them to get access to the same supports that domestic students have. Thank you. Very well said. Very well said, Tamara. Thank you. Um, so uh, we'll reach out to you, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, a couple of weeks uh, later. So now let us go to our last uh, speaker of the day, last but not the least, uh, by any stretch of imagination, Nagasarat Pandurangi. Um, he is a regional business development manager for Seneca College uh, with 10 plus years of experience in higher education. Nagasrat has worked extensively with higher education institutions. His first job was working with a reputed Australian university where he worked as a coordinator for higher degrees by research. He moved on to do work as a research associate at IIT Badras on the topic financing of small and medium scale enterprises. Later, he worked with a management consulting firm as assistant manager, research and partnerships, where he has worked on a multiple research projects of 30 plus foreign universities. During the same time, he has also worked on a research project for Canadian High Commission. <clears throat> After moving to Canada in 2017, he started working with Seneca as a project manager research and partnerships for South Asia and had progress to his current designation as a regional business development manager for South Asian region. Nagasarat believes in lifelong learning and is a P-Tech 
in biotechnology mba in film and media and is currently pursuing his mba in leadership in higher education from the university of toronto his passion is in education environment and entertainment and has produced couple of short feature films titled the parabola and silence so over to you nagesh uh, you are on mute always happens uh, thank you so much upul bhai and um, to all the respected panelists it is uh, very difficult to follow this kind of a panel and come at the end because most of my points have been spoken uh, by my colleagues across uh, but i'll try to uh, put my perspective forward um, uh, with what we have been able to support the international students with uh first of all i would like to uh, thank ms apurva shrivatsava consul general of india as our keynote speaker today uh, apurva shrivatsava ji and her team have been a pillar of support for international student community and they have been a number of supporting programs running for international students um according to um as it comes to canada as a study destination diversity has always been canada's strength and canada welcomes uh, international students representing over 150 countries from across the world and we can see that on our campus at seneca the number of international students in canadian universities and colleges has grown rapidly over the past decade uh, if you look at uh, how the world has uh, the international education market has shifted earlier it was uk then it was australia um us has always been number 1 uh, but the number 2 position was always shifting between uk australia and now um, canada is among the top so the if you look at these international uh, shifts um, particularly it is because of the migration opportunities that the students get international students also bring so much cultural and linguistic diversity um, of course to the campus and the classroom and student life um canada makes it easy for international students to become permanent residents if they want to remain in the country they have the post graduate work permit that allows international students to stay even after study and work for 3 years if they're graduating a 2 year diploma uh after working in canada for one or uh, one year or more international students uh, may be eligible for a permanent residency this is a wonderful pathway opportunity particularly to students who are looking to migrate to another country and settle down there that comes um, as an opportunity for them all was going well um, but suddenly after covid 19 pandemic began in march 20 uh, march 2020 students in canadian universities and colleges faced a lot of challenges they were unable to fly to uh, due to travel restrictions many students got their plans delayed due to uh, the pandemic but the canadian government was flexible to allow the students to study online and also be eligible for post graduate work permit that allowed students to study back home and that presented the colleges and universities with a greater challenge to offer the programs in um, in the virtual mode so we have Uh, as seneca we have created a number of modes for the students to choose from we have online hybrid flexible and also in person mode um so this allows the students to choose the flexibility that they want um, whether they can go hybrid or flexible or completely online uh, this also helped international students in variety of modes to study as per their convenience um and as a result the international students who started their study during the pandemic they could do 100% of their study online uh, outside of canada and still be able to get the post graduate work permit after completing their program completely online that support was uh, uh, really helpful for canadian institutions to maintain uh, the international students numbers and also um they have allowed until 31st of august as um, uh, sandeep mentioned in his remarks that they are allowed to study online till 31st of august and we are and um, we are still waiting for their um um for the directions to uh, connect with the international students 
the unprecedented and number of students studying online from another country means we have to move all our uh, existing support services also online which was a hurt herculean task for all the colleges and i can imagine um, even for the universities uh, starting from student registration to counseling to mental health support systems we have moved everything online and students are able to make appointments and i uh completely agree with sandeep's points where he said um uh, they have to ask and most of the things are available one of the points that um uh, my co my co panelists have mentioned is about the cultural differences uh, as an international student moving from home country to new country is a significant change and uh, in early days in canada students may experience a number of academic cultural differences starting from like um talking about plagiarism uh, we were talking about how to uh, remain calm during a discussion and let the other person complete his point so these kind of cultural differences are uh, very important and our international student services is designed to help the students uh, for easily translationing their life uh, at seneca so in uh, on the cultural front uh, at the international department we have a team of student ambassadors from various regions who can speak different international languages um, we currently have 30 plus students calling the students actively and giving them uh, advice in various things and they can also help them uh, navigate their early days in canada um, this is on the cultural front when we look at the academic front for those who need help with their resources our learning centers provide various approaches to learning and supporting including workshops tutoring and one on one sessions for these students uh, exam preparation and online learning supports uh, we can also help the students with uh, we also help the students with a program called uh, student mentoring in life and education it is called the smile program at sanaka which gives uh, one on one mentoring to students in their particular subject um so the mentoring also needs to be in their particular subject so that they can they can uh, flourish in their studies as well seneca understands the importance of counseling and accessible learning services and hence we have a separate department for counseling uh, counselors have um, have helped to students through their difficult moments uh, during covid pandemic counseling and accessibility services are being offered online and at by phone call Uh, our services are free and the confident uh, confidential and available to all the registered international students at sanaka and students are seen um, uh, on a voluntary basis coming and talking to us uh, on these phone lines available for them at any time we also have a sanaka safe app which is uh, available at a click in case they have an sos and an emergency they can use that app to let us know and our our uh, security department will uh, revert to them uh, within a few minutes sanaka counselors are all uh, always approachable they have the required degrees uh, as per the ontario government ontario college counselors committee is also uh, overseeing this counseling department and we also have uh, uh, regulated healthcare professionals at the campus and also available on a phone call so this helps the students when they are unable to move uh, if they are uh, they if they have a health difficulty and they are unable to move from their place they can give us a call and there is a helpline health helpline available we also have a mental health helpline um, in terms of good to talk um, where students can just call and talk to uh, hospital emergency services um, and also about their health insurance outside of ontario we have uh my wellness and which is supported by bell let's talk if the students have are not in ontario and they have traveled to some other province for a purpose uh they can talk uh to us through bell let's talk we have coordinated that and students who are outside of canada who are studying online as well we have a keep me safe program with with uh, my ssp which is um which is an app which can be downloaded and uh, a phone service is available for them as well so these are briefly some of the aspects that i would like to touch upon and 
adding to uh, what my fellow panelists have said uh, in terms of bringing them together as a as a uh, community uh, seneca student federation is a big body that uh, takes a lot of uh, uh, initiatives to bring them all together starting from having uh, holy uh, celebrating holy which is a cultural festival we celebrate diwali uh, on campus we bring them all together um, like sandeep mentioned there are uh, travel programs uh, you can go to ottawa niagara uh, or montreal so these trips are being arranged by seneca student federation as well um, we have a um, uh, we also understand that it becomes difficult for them to travel from one campus to another. So Sanka Student Federation allows um, free transport. We have a bus service, a bus shuttle service, which allows students to move across campuses uh, in a free manner. And of course, uh, for the Indian uh, students who are playing cricket, um, because I am a cricket buff myself, as Sandeep has mentioned, uh, in the winter, it is difficult to play cricket. So we have a dome. We allow them to have a mat within the dome so that they can play, play cricket even in the winter. So these are uh, some of the initiatives that Seneca does in order to make them feel at home and they're not missing it. As small as playing cricket also can bring uh, a lot of joy to the students when they're away from home. So these are the things that we do. And uh, I also extend my um, gratitude to all the panelists here who are supporting in different ways. Um, uh, I have almost met with all of them uh, in person to discuss these things um, and uh, thankful uh, for this opportunity today. I'll end there and over to you, Vipal. Sure, absolutely. So um, two quick questions, if you can give brief answers and then we can close the session. Um, although you have touched based upon them briefly in your remarks, um, so one is more personal side, one is on their career side. Uh, the biggest issues students face include a sense of loneliness and not knowing the help and resources available to them. So what is being done to make that information and help available to them? Yes, we will. So basically, as I said, we have uh, international student calling campaign that goes on for students, uh, where we call each student and talk to them about their current situation in terms of their application process. And once they reach here, also we call them to understand where they are in terms of that. And uh, as my fellow panelists has mentioned, even Kanaka has a in-person representative in India who conducts uh, pre-departure sessions before they come here in order to make sure that they understand uh, Canada is not as populated as India. And you will not, if you are walking on a, a sidewalk, you will, all you see will be cars and you never know whether there are people or there are robotic cars. That's how sometimes it happens. And I faced it myself as a person, right? Like when I came here on PR, I was living in Brampton. Uh, I used to walk to the nearest grocery store and all I could see is cars. I couldn't see people on the road walking like me. So uh, it gives a different cultural perspective to students and they do feel lonely. So mm -hmm. as I've mentioned, we have these uh, counseling services available and the calling uh, opportunities that they have. And we also have, uh, uh, like I've mentioned, it's, uh, there is a, uh, also a smile mentoring which happens one-on-one. -on -one. Now we have extended that smile mentoring even before the student registers for the program. Uh, because we understand that they have to know what they are getting into even before they land in Canada. So this smile program has will be extended from September to all the students who are in India also, so that they can have that one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And they feel that they have a friend in Canada before they land here. So th that's what we do. Okay, and the lastly, um, what assistance does Seneca provide uh, to the students to find suitable jobs in the field that they study for? You know, because in many cases we see the degrees become a certificate on the wall and the student, end, student ends up working in completely different field, doing something totally diff different, you know, so that these things don't happen. I mean, what is the institution doing uh, in that regard? Yeah, so I mean, I would give myself as an example. Uh, when you read my bio, 
Uh, you can see that I've done life technology, I've done films, I've done uh, um, a financing um, a project with IIT Madras. So I, I mean, in my personal opinion, there is nothing like a perfect job. Um, I mean, that's my personal opinion when I say it, because it's always uh, a learning curve for anyone to see what they're fit into and what they're and if you look at these students, when we say Indian students, they come here at an age of 16, 17. Uh, I took uh, at least 26 years of my life. I was still finding what I should do. I didn't know what to do, right? So it, I was finding different venues uh, to study and then where I could flourish. So, so I found out that research was where I could flourish. And then I did my MBA and then I went into consulting uh, so it's a learning curve for any student, but definitely there is a lot of support that is available for them to start where they want to. Some students are very, uh, are very particular about where they want to study and what job they have to do. So for them, it might be a little easier. For someone who is who wanders around, it might be a little difficult. But um, in terms of Seneca, we have uh, uh, something called Seneca Works portal where they can upload their resume. We also have Seneca career team, which helps each student with their resume. We also conduct mock interviews for them before, because most of them have not faced an interview in their life. And suddenly they have to face a North American uh, interview panel uh, where they go very uh, systematically. So we have those support systems where they do a one-on-one -on -one mock interview with the students before they mm -hmm. go on to an actual interview. And this Seneca Works program gives all uh, part-time co-op and also full-time opportunities for students to apply. And this coordinator, the career coordinator will help them do the interviews. And even to the extent that they'll call and find out from the students if they have done the interview or not, because sometimes uh, we, we do the meeting and uh, the employer is waiting, the student wouldn't show up because he's scared. So yeah. we do all that um, and we help them to get through the interview. We tell them that failing is okay, but they have to keep trying. Sure, absolutely. So uh, thank you for that. I mean, the only concern I was trying to express is, you know, it's one thing that you do, you study something and then you choose something else, you know, of your own choice. And it's totally a different thing that you spend thousands of dollars, complete a two year, three year, four year course. And then you're not able to find anything in that, uh, particular sector and you are forced to pick up, you know, all right. jobs, different jobs, because that will also contribute greatly to the stress and mental health issues, which Anupama can uh, also uh, vouch for. So um, thank you for that. And uh, before I give the closing remarks, uh, Anupama wanted to make a quick point. So go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Vipulji, to put this together. Um, it gives everyone a chance to connect that we normally wouldn't be able to. Um, also, I wanted to share that there's a participant here that I've asked to attend. Her name is Shalini Toscano. Um, you know, once media, whether good or bad, uh, whatever form, we, uh, Kamal and myself were interviewed and we've had the community reach out mm -hmm. um, significantly. And a lot of them have stepped forward. So Shalini is with an organization called Sayog and they want to support the mental health component. So the students that are both facing a mental health crisis. So not just, so Shalini lives in Montreal. So they have folks across the country. Um, and I think that's where we were sort of, uh, that I had mentioned before, that there's sort of a gap, right? So we have our services here, helping the students, but what about across the country? So Sayog is a, an, another organization that we've partnered with. And I just wanted to say that, you know, if you can create just a space where this conversation can continue to happen, Vipulji, in whatever capacity, it would be really grateful, and I really appreciate that you that you put this together. Oh, absolutely, I, it will be an honor actually if we can uh, play a small part, you know, in making life easier uh, for international students, especially from India. So if you can share uh, Shalini's contact, you know, email phone number um, later on, you know, by email, I'll be happy to reach out to her and put together another session. Uh, possibly just on the issue of mental health uh, for international students. I'll be more than happy to do it. And now that we are getting into in-person activities, we'll also be putting together uh, these education conferences in person uh, as well very soon. So uh, with that, uh, this was our third session. Uh, 
uh, in the Canada India Education uh, Forum, uh, hosted by Impact Media and uh, Events uh, Corporation. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers today, the Consul General of India, um, as well for uh, for giving the keynote. Uh, our uh, presenting sponsors, uh, Tangentia and Yukon, and all our annual sponsors, uh, Simply Financial, Efficiency Canada, Home Hotel and Resort Limited, One Place, Pavi Bidding, Natural Services, Seneca College, Skyline Capital Corp, SBI Canada Bank, ICICI Bank Canada, Apal <coughs> Insurance, and uh, we uh, we would love to have more colleges and uh, universities partner with us. Uh, on an ongoing basis, so we can continue to work together uh, in this education sector. So with that, thank you everyone once again. Um, thank you. Before we go, can we all just look into the cameras real quick, smile, at the okay. count of three. One, two, three, smile. Okay, let me check. Okay, everybody's eyes are open. Good. Happy Friday. <laughs> thank you. 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 This session is now formally closed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.